All right. Hey, everybody. Today, um, <clears throat> I'll be talking about uh, metabolic liver disease, and it's, um, you know, it's an extensive topic. There's, like, many things that can be involved in this, but uh, mainly I'm um, going to talk a little bit about what, what is metabolic liver disease, and then we're going to talk about mainly three diseases, the hemochromatosis, Wilson's disease, and alpha-1 antitrypsin deficiency. Um, there are others like glycogen storage diseases, uh, you know, other inborn errors in metabolism, but it's just too wide for, for, uh, for this lecture to cover. So metabolic liver disease, they include the, any congenital protein or enzymatic deficiencies, um, as well as inborn errors in metabolism. And although, you know, NAFLD or now called metabolic associated liver disease, MAFLD is, is, is a metabolic liver disease. Again, it's, it's, or we already talked about that and it's beyond um, this lecture. Uh, so the first one I'm going to start talking about is hemochromatosis. Uh, and, you know, historically, uh, hemochromatosis was actually first described in like 1865, uh, where Trousseau described the first case. And then, you know, 25 years later, uh, it got its name uh, from uh, von Rickling-Hausen, who called it the blood color disease, hemochromatosis, because of the skin pigmentation. That's where the, the name comes from. I'm, I don't know if you're moving the slides. I'm sorry to interrupt, but we are still, that, you're still you stuck on the first slides? slide. We can see the slides, but it's stuck on the first slide. Oh, really? Let me uh, share yeah. and reshare. Hold on. Now? Now looks good. Thanks. Awesome. Yep. Um, and then, you know, later on in 1976, they discovered the actual association between a, the chromosome 6 and HLA region. And finally, you know, more recently, like 20 years ago, 1996, where they actually discovered the HFE gene, which is now we know is responsible for the majority of, of cases of hemochromatosis, of hereditary hemochromatosis. Um, and uh, we'll talk more about it. So when we talk about iron overload, um, we generally mean hemochromatosis when we're thinking about it in the liver context, but iron overload can be either primary, it can be coming from a hereditary cause or like a primary cause, or it can be a secondary iron overload. And secondary iron overload causes, these are not all the causes, but there is many of them. The main important one that we need to know is the iatrogenic, where we give people a lot of, you know, uh, blood transfusions, the setting of thalassemia or uh, chronic uh, aplastic anemias. Uh, and then they get iron overloaded, or if they're getting uh, IV iron supplements for a prolonged period of time, they can. Um, while, you know, hereditary causes like hemochromatosis, which are many different types, and the main type that, that we commonly refer to as hemochromatosis is this uh, homozygous type, the C2, uh, C2A2Y um, mutation. And so... Uh, to understand what actually happens and how we end up in hemochromatosis, the pathophysiology, the main problem or the main pathophysiology is an increased intestinal absorption of iron. Uh, and the reason why you will have increased intestinal absorption of iron is because you don't have the regular uh, mechanisms or regulatory mechanism that stops your intestine from absorbing iron that is mainly uh, driven by hepcidin. And this is, again, in hemochromatosis or hereditary hemochromatosis, it's mainly due to the uh, HFE uh, mutation that kind of stops hepcidin from being transcribed. And finally, you end up with iron overload and, and iron depositing in the tissue, or, or what we call hemosiderosis, which is iron deposit, de depositing in the tissue and cause, causing uh, damage to the tissue, and finally fibrosis, mainly in the liver. And so the intestinal iron absorption, you know, you, on, from the luminal side, this is an enterocyte, and the luminal side you have, you know, you have the um, the ferric, which is the the oxidized iron, becomes reduced on the brush border surf, uh, on the brush border by ferric reductase, and then you absorb the reduced iron, um, which can be stored in the enterocyte, and this is one of the ways you get rid of the iron is by shedding the enterocyte. The ferritin goes with it, and then you get rid of some of the iron, and then through this uh, iron uh, porter called ferroportin on the other side, um, you, you end up uh, uh, absorbing into the blood, into the portal circulation, and then finally into the liver. And so uh, the mechanism of absorption, this whole mechanism of absorption is actually uh, inhibited by hepcidin. So hepcidin is a regulatory uh, enzyme, a uh, regulatory protein. 
so you know you have the duodenal enterocyte, you absorb the iron through it, and then hepcidin inhibits this absorption. The other big source of iron is from the blood itself. When you destroy all senescent uh, red blood cells, um, the heme gets released, and the heme is um, you know gets uh, processed in the reticulum in the in the macrophages, and then uh, you end up having iron. Uh, from that source. And again, hepcidin is an inhibitor for both of these processes. Uh, and so if you have any defective hepcidin or not enough hepcidin, then you will have um, uh, essentially uh, iron overload. And so, you know, what actually promotes hepcidin? What, what makes hepcidin increase in your body? So there's four big categories by which hepcidin is actually regulated. It's either erythropoiesis itself. So if there is, you know, there's a lot of erythropoiesis that, that uh, can inhibit hepcidin production. And then the iron status itself, which is if you have, you know, if you have a lot of iron in your body, uh, you know, technically you should be promoting hepcidin to be released. And, and so you inhibit further absorption of iron and further release. And this mechanism of, of the sensing of the iron status is mainly driven by the HFE protein, um, as well as other associated proteins, such as the transferrin receptor proteins and uh, the hemojuvalin protein, you hear about it. <coughs> These all proteins work together to, to tell hepcidin to, to stop iron absorption and stop iron accumulation. The other ones is actually due to inflammation and, and uh, oxygen tension. Uh, so these, you, you know, these are the reason why you would have like anemia of chronic disease where you know, hepcidin inhibits um, iron absorption due to that. And so this is kind of a more like it's it's essentially the same the same um, figure just a little bit more uh, uh, simple. But what this what this says is that you have you know multiple mechanisms that drive hepcidin to be released, and any problem in any of these mechanisms or any of these proteins, you essentially will will end up in in a in a problem in, in iron and possibly hematosis. And the main one to talk about is the HFE gene, which is uh, related to iron sensing. And so the prevalence of actual HFE-related hemochromatosis is uh, similar across U.S., Europe, and Australia, and it's about one in 200 to 400 cases. So it's or people, uh, and so it's it's not that uncommon. So you will be able to see it mainly in Northern European descents, um, and then you know less common in African ancestry, like like a lot of our patients that we see here. And 80 percent of the cases of hereditary hemochromatosis actually caused by a, mut a specific mutation in the gene, the C2A2Y um, mutation in the HFE gene that, that, that is a homozygous, which means you have a two hit. Um, while other, uh, other, other mutations can be, you know, an, another mutation in the gene, and, and then you can have what we call a compound heterozygote, which you have the driver mutation, the C2A2Y, and then you have another uh, mutation such as the H63D. Uh, most most of these patients actually are, uh, are um, asymptomatic, but those who are symptomatic, they tend to present at age 40 to 50. Um, and although, you know, the mutation is actually distributed equally between men and women, the clinical penetrance of the mutation um, to, to become a phenotype, to become hemochromatosis is actually low. Uh, and it's way lower in, in women than in men. In fact, you know, not everybody with, who's a homozygote for C2A2Y will have hemochromatosis, will have iron overload. You know, of men, only 28% will have it, and of women, about 1% will have it. So the, the clinical penetrance is important. So not, that's why we don't tend to just uh, screen by sending the mutation, because you might have the mutation, but, you know, chances are, you know, maybe up to 28% you, you will have iron, iron overload. And so... You know, the, when we talk about iron overload or hemochromatosis, the, the clinical um, the clinical presentation may be variable. It's not just liver; it's more of a systemic disease. So you do get iron depo uh, depositions in, in the rest of your body, um, but mainly you get it in the liver, and then you might get it, you know, in the skin and in pancreas and in, um, and uh, in other organs. That we'll talk more about the clinical manifestations next. Um, and so, again. Many of these patients are actually asymptomatic uh, and no physical findings, so you won't uh, see them presenting with any specific symptoms. And um, a lot of them, you might end up finding them through screening because somebody was diagnosed, their first-degree relative was diagnosed with hemochromatosis, and so they got screened, and 
and they ended up getting um, getting the the genetic test, and so they ended up getting diagnosed. Uh, and so, uh, because of the screening methods, because now we do a lot of screening for it, if you look at the if you look specifically here at the cirrhosis, this is throughout time. So this is through, you know, 1950s and then in the 1990s, uh, you see that the amount of cirrhotics, you know, went down. And the reason is because uh, we're screening more often. We're finding them early and we're starting treatment early on, um, not because of the disease becoming less, less common or, or benign. And so the important hepatic manifestations um, are mainly due to precipitation of iron in the liver, accumulation of iron in the liver, causing damage uh, to the actual hepatocytes. And it's uh, mainly affected in, in what we call the type 1 hemochromatosis, which is when you have a homozygote uh, C2A2Y uh, mutation. Uh, and so you have oxidative injury that overwhelms the hepatocytes, antioxidative mechanisms, and so you end up with hepatocyte damage and, and fibrosis. And clinically, uh, they're really physically, they're, they're asymptomatic. They might have right upper quadrant abdominal pain, um, uh, but you know, they, the other thing is on, on their chemistries, you might have asymptomatic elevation of liver enzymes. And then finally they may end up in end stage liver disease at cirrhosis. Uh, the important thing about people with hemochromatosis is that they are really susceptible to other forms of liver damage, including specifically alcohol consumption. Um, so, uh, People with hemochromatosis and who drink alcohol compared to those without hemochromatosis are um, ninefold uh, more, uh, have the ninefold risk of developing cirrhosis compared to those who don't have hemochromatosis. So it's really kind of, you know, it makes sense, but, you know, ninefold is, is a big number. So it's really important for us to talk to them about alcohol consumption and alcohol abstinence. The other thing is that they may develop hepatocellular carcinoma. Now, you know, most of them will develop hepatocellular carcinoma in the setting of cirrhosis, but even without cirrhosis, it's still, it can still happen. Um, and so the, the relative risk is about 20 to 200 fold. Uh, and the, the main indicator of hepatocellular carcinoma or pro prognostic uh, indicator is actually the ferritin level um, in those people. And a ferritin level above 2000 in hemochromatosis is a indica indicates a high risk for, for hepatocellular carcinoma. And the 10-year incidence um, uh, in, in uh, hemochromatosis cirrhosis for HCC is actually 6 to 10%. However, even though despite this increased risk, the general recommendation is to screen them just as we screen our regular cirrhotics, just Q6 months, um, uh, ultrasound and AFP. Uh, uh, and even if you iron unload them, even if you remove the iron from them, you still have to continue screening, just like all other cirrhotics. Now, how about, again, how about the patients without cirrhosis? So if you have somebody with hemochromatosis who does not have cirrhosis, has stage three or less fibrosis, uh, then the ACG, the latest ACG guidelines, at least the, the 2019 guidelines, do not recommend routine screening for HCC. Um, so we, we don't have to screen those patients for HCC, even though they might be at a slightly increased risk for HCC without cirrhosis. We only begin screening them if they are cirrhotics, just like other cirrhotics. The other manifestations for hemochromatosis is skin pigmentations. So this happens due to um, increased melanin production uh, and the position of actual iron into the skin. And this, you know, this is referred as the bronzing of the skin. And when this is associated with diabetes, they, they, you know, they generally call it the bronze diabetes. Uh, and this only occurs when the total iron uh, content reaches about 20 grams in your body. So uh, it's not a common finding, but you may see it. Other findings include joint manifestations. So people, uh, patients may present with arthralgias and actual uh, arthritis. And it's a specific form of arthritis, mainly affects the second and third uh, MCP joint. And on the x-ray, the specific finding is finding these hook-like osteophytes um, on the MCP joint. Uh, and there's, they might also have other joint uh, manifestations and, uh, you know, there's a close association or like, you know, this is kind of a board question where somebody presents with pseudogout or CPPD and then, you know, the association is hemochromatosis. It's just something to keep in mind. Um, the other thing is that iron may deposit into the, um, into the heart, into the cardiomyocytes and can cause either a restrictive 
uh, cardiomyopathy due it's like an infiltrative disease or dilated cardiomyopathy and it's secondary to iron accumulation it may also deposit in the SA node and the AV node and it might cause sick sinus syndrome and AFib and some people may present as a presenting symptom of hemochromatosis may present with uh, CHF uh, however, this is pretty, it's low prevalence in hemochromatosis, and one study showed it, it's about, you know, a little bit less than 1% of, of about 3,000 patients that they looked at. Um, so it's not really the common manifestation. The other one is diabetes. So um, you can have um, developing diabetes because of iron overload, and it's about, you know, 13 to 23%. And this is secondary to two things. The first thing is the pancreatic beta cells may accumulate iron, and that can be toxic to the actual beta cells and decreased uh, insulin production. And the other thing is that um, when you have hepatic damage, when you have um, liver damage, that may drive insulin resistance related to the liver damage. And both of these mechanisms will drive uh, diabetes. The other important important thing uh, to remember is hypogonadism. Uh, so uh, iron uh, actually accumulates in the pituitary gland, and that can uh, end up in hypogonadotropic hypogonadism. And this is actually the most common non-diabetic endocrine disorder in hemochromatosis. Uh, and in men, usually presents with impotence and a loss uh, of libido, as well as osteoporosis because of the um, uh, deficiency. Uh, hypogonadism and in women may present with amenorrhea or, or premature menopause so it's just a thing in mind uh, the thing is, is there is some infectious manifestations or infections that, that tend to occur more in patients who are iron overload and uh, these are typically secondary to what we call the iron loving organisms um, uh, this, they, they love to test these on, on the boards, although they are rare to occur. And, you know, these include uh, Vibrio, Listeria, Yersinia, uh, are the typical ones that we hear about. Again, this, these are still rare and probably you won't really see them. But if you do see somebody with like Vibrio bacteremia, then maybe you have to think about some, some iron overload states. So... When we talk about screening for, for hemochromatosis, generally, for the general population, it is not recommended. You don't want to screen the general population for hemochromatosis. Um, uh, the people you want to screen is uh, specifically is somebody who's a first-degree relative or somebody with hemochromatosis. Somebody is diagnosed with hemochromatosis and has a first-degree relative, you want to screen those people. Um, for hemochromatosis. And how do we actually screen first degree relatives? Anybody knows? So if somebody has a first degree relative with, with C282Y, you know, homozygotes, how do you, uh, how do you screen them? No one, no, no one wants to throw an answer? Pick somebody from the audience. Vamsi. Oh, I have to pick on somebody. Yeah, pick up on Bamsi. <laughs> I'm not sure. I guess you would, you would do genetic testing as well. So that's what I thought. I thought you do genetic testing, but actually you just send a, you send an iron panel and ferritin. You actually send like a transferrin saturation and ferritin, and only if those are positive, it's transferrin saturation is more than 45%, then you want to send genetic testing. So you just screen them like we screen those people with acute liver injury or chronic liver disease workup, essentially. And so, you know, part of the diagnosis is to actually establish the diagnosis. The first initial workup, again, with anybody with chronic liver disease is to send the iron panel, transfer saturation, and send the serum ferritin levels. And, you know, part of it is actually calculating this TIBC. Uh, I just put in a figure on how to calculate the TIBC. And then the other thing we usually see is this UIBC, the unsaturated iron padding capacity, which is just essentially the, the unsaturated transferrin um, in, in, the, in the blood. Um, so it's, it's just going to be low if the transferrin is saturated. And then, you know, if you have a transferrin saturation of more than 45%, in one study at least, it actually identified, you know, almost 100% of people with a homozygote mutation. So, you know, if it's more than 45%, the transferrin saturation, then uh, you actually have a good specificity uh, for um, for uh, for hemochromatosis. And so your next workup uh, should be looking at uh, the serum ferritin levels and then looking at the genetic mutation. And so uh, 
what's important about serum ferritin levels is that they actually predict uh, two things. They predict advanced fibrosis in hemochromatosis, and they are predictors of uh, HCC risk. Uh, the problem with serum ferritin level is that in the acute setting, they are it's an acute phase reactant, and they may be elevated due to other liver conditions, such as even Hep C and uh, MAFLD and, and even in hepatocellular carcinoma. And so, you know, uh, you just keep that in mind, but you may you you want to take the serum ferritin level as um, as an important indicator of the severity of the disease. And so if you have normal ferritin and a TSAT of less than 45%, it's, a, it's actually essentially an exclusion for somebody with hemochromatosis. It has a negative predictive value of about 90, 97% for iron overload. And so after you send those, the next step is to do the genetic testing. And it's important for us to kind of understand what, what it means when we get back certain mutations. Um, so we have to remember that Hereditary hemochromatosis is an autosomal recessive disease, except one specific type, which is type 4. And this is the ferroportin mutation, where, where you know, you just need one, one, uh, one mutation in ferroportin, and then you will have intestinal absorption that does not respond to hepcidin. Um, again, this is very rare to occur, and it, it ends up in what we call juvenile hemochromatosis, and we might not even see it in adults. Uh, the main important mutations is the mutations of the HFE gene, and these include the, the C282Y, um, H63D, and S65C mutations. And usually they report all these all three mutations when you send the genetic test. Um, and, you know, you have to have two mutations because it's an autosomal recessive disease. And the important thing to remember is you also have to have the C282Y mutation um, with another mutation. So if you have a homozygous mutation for the C282Y, then this is the classical type 1, what we, what, what we classically think about when we think about uh, hemochromatosis. But if you have a compound mutation with the H63D or the S65C, um, these will cause, you know, another like other types of hemochromatosis that are not as severe um, as the, the type 1. If you don't have the C2A2Y uh, mutation, you just have the, some some sort of uh, combination of the other mutations. This is actually this actually does not cause iron overload, and it's not pathologic. So you may as well ignore it. Um, in, uh, and you know the other question that might come to mind: Do you do you need to test for other mutations? We talked about other proteins like H, uh, like the hemojuvenile and the the transferrin uh, receptor mutations. Um, don't actually they're very rare. To the point where you don't actually need to test for them. Um, you know, the other mutations are actually one in like millions and millions of people. Uh, and when you when you do suspect uh, something else is going on, you have to look for something else. Look for alternative explanations um, for why this person has iron overload rather than uh, other forms of hemochromatosis. Um, and in fact, the recommendations is that you know, for the people with the, the other mutations than the C2A2Y mutation, um, you have you just tell them that they are not at increased risk for iron overload, and the ACG suggests against further uh, genetic testing for these people. Which leads us to the next step. You know, if if you're really you know in doubt um, of the of the um, of the diagnosis, or if you do have hemochromatosis of the homozygote, C2A2Y homozygote, and you have a ferritin level of above 1,000. We talked about it. 1,000 is a predictor, or ferritin level is a predictor of advanced fibrosis. So these people with homozygote uh, and a, a ferritin of more than 1,000, these, uh, these people should undergo um, a liver biopsy, and mainly due to, to assess the stage of fibrosis, to accurately assess the stage of fibrosis. Um, and so you're looking for fibrosis staging in these people. You're looking at the trichrome stain. And then the other thing you're looking for is the distribution of the iron stores. And then this one, you know, what stain do we use for uh, looking at iron? Prussian blue. Prussian blue, right. So the stain is the, the Pearl's Prussian blue stain. And what they what they will, the pathologists, what they calculate is something called hepatic iron concentration and hepatic iron index, which is just uh, the iron concentration by age. 
and that's what they will give it back to you. And, and you know, the specific manifestation or the specific pathognomonic features is that you have stainable iron in the hepatocytes, but not in the copper cells, so not in the reticular endothelial cells, which means that there is actual deposition of iron there is um, in the hepatocyte, but there, it's not coming from a secondary cause, from the reticular endothelial cells or reticular endothelial system. And then you have a... Um, uh, a, a high iron uh, concentration and a high iron index. And so this is a Prussian blue stain and you know you see the iron deposits uh, in the hepatocyte in the cores of hepatocytes. Um, and you know another, another picture again you see it uh, in the periportal region deposits in the hepatocytes. And although here you might see a little bit in the cup for cells, but it's less prominent. Essentially, less prominent iron staining in the reticular endothelial cells and cup for cells in the iron. That's the hallmark of um, actual hereditary hemochromatosis or primary hemochromatosis. So, you know, how about other non-invasive imaging modalities? So you, you might think, you know, let's do something else to quantify the iron. So... Some people looked at fiber scan and asked the question, can you actually use a fiber scan to diagnose and look for like uh, look for ferritin levels? Um, and, you know, generally this is not recommended. It does not correlate with the ferritin level and might not give you a, a good indicator of the severity of, of, of the hemochromatosis. And so what they generally recommend is actually MRI. And so when you do the MRI of the, of the, of the liver, um, you want to look uh, for loss of signal. So iron deposition in the liver will cause a dark, um, a dark liver on T2, uh, on T2 imaging. And so you will have loss of signal, and then you want to quantify it by measuring the ratio of the liver to reference tissue. And this specific quantification is actually made uh, available by a software update to the MRI-like software. And this is not available in all institutes. So I know here, like, for example, in Kings County, they don't have the software. So they, they're, not, they're unable to quantify the iron level. Uh, in the liver based based on the MRI, but they're able to tell you, oh, there's a lot of iron, this is iron plus plus or, or whatever, like severe, moderate, or it's more like qualitative than quantitative, but there is actually software that lets you quantitate. The other thing, the important thing about the MRI, it actually can distinguish um, between HFE-related hemochromatosis, which is primary hemochromatosis, and secondary iron overload. So you can actually distinguish between these two causes by an MRI. Anybody knows how? What is like? What is the finding on MRI that can distinguish between a primary and a secondary cause? <clears throat> it's actually, I mean, I, I I didn't know that, but you know, looking at it, you you want to look at the spleen, and they do look at the spleen to, to to liver ratio in terms of iron deposition, and this is a nice example. So on the left side here, you see, you know, essentially a black liver and a white spleen. And which means the iron is only deposited in the liver and not in the reticular endothelial system, which is the hallmark of, of primary hemochromatosis. Meanwhile, if you have, you know, both the liver and the spleen are, are dark or has, have iron deposits, then um, you might want to consider a secondary form of hemochromatosis. And so, you know... Why is that, Mohammed? Because because iron is in secondary hemochromatosis, iron is um, is being you know uptaken by the by the reticular endothelial system and the, by the macrophages and processed in the spleen and it gets deposited in the spleen. Um, meanwhile, in, in primary hemochromatosis, it directly goes to the liver because you have an increased intestinal absorption um, and it just deposited more in the liver than in the spleen. And again, this also reflected by the biopsy. When you do a biopsy for, for people with the primary, the Kupfer cells don't stain. Um, meanwhile, in secondary, they do. And so the question is, do you want to do an MRI or a liver biopsy to assess hepatic iron content? Um, and you know, generally, you can do an MRI. With somebody with hemochromatosis um, and suspected iron overload, you can do an MRI if you do have the software to actually quantify how much iron is deposited in the, in the liver and you can make a diagnosis of hemochromatosis. However, the only exception, just remember, anybody who's a homozygote for C2A2Y and has a ferritin of more than 1,000, there's no runaway. You have to get the biopsy because that's, that's what's going you know, what's, what's to look at their staging, uh, fibrosis staging for them and uh, actual quantification of the iron. 
And so this is kind of the suggested algorithm of how of, of how to screen, who to screen. So if you look here, anybody who's you know symptomatic has any of the symptoms we mentioned, or has you know, part of the acute liver injury, chronic liver disease workup, um, or is an adult first degree relative of somebody who's a, who has uh, hemochromatosis, then you send a, a TSAT and you send a ferritin level. And then, you know, if your TSAT is less than 45% and you have a normal ferritin level, then you're done. Uh, you don't need to do the genetic testing. While if you have a high, you know, uh, TSAT or you have a high ferritin, then you might want to do the, the genotype. And, you know, again, if your genotype is homozygote and your ferritin is above 1,000, um, then you might want to do a, you want to do a liver biopsy. Meanwhile, if it's, you know, if it's less than 1,000 and, you know, you have maybe normal liver enzymes, then you want to go directly toward uh, therapeutics, which is phlebotomy mainly. Um, while if you have a compound heterozygote or non-C2A2Y, then the first thing is to evaluate for other for other causes and maybe get an MRI to, to see other like secondary causes of hemochromatosis to establish the actual diagnosis. And so the, the treatment, um, before we talk about the actual treatment, the indication of actual treatment is, is the following. If you have a homozygote for a C2A2Y and a ferritin level uh, above 300 generally, but it's 300 for men, 200 for women, and the TSAT is more than 45%. So if you have all these, then you may start treatment. Um, another indication is if you have a compound heterozygote, um, if only if other causes are not ident identified for liver injury and the first is above 1,000. So this is 1,000, not 300 or 200. Uh, and the TSAT is above 45%. Then these, these two people you might want to uh, start treatment on. And the mainstay of treatment is actually phlebotomy, which was described, you know, more than 70 years ago or so. Um, and there is an initiation phase and there is a maintenance phase. The initiation phase is, you know, where you do it weekly. You move about, you know, 500 to, to 1,000 ml of blood weekly, um, depending on how the patient tolerates. And you want to check the hemoglobin, you know, during the treatment, before, after, and then, you know, maintain a hemoglobin level of 11 and do a monthly ferritin checks. Meanwhile, once you get them to the maintenance phase, which is once you get the ferritin under control, um, then uh, you do uh, the phlebotomy like three to four times yearly just to maintain their, their ferritin. What is the target? What is the actual target ferritin? Um, we said, you know, we're tracking the ferritin for these people. How, how low do you want to get it? Anybody? It's fine. So it's, it's 50 to 100. That's the target you want to keep them at. So you want to keep phlebotomizing until 50 or 100, and then you put them in the maintenance phase, um, and then you continue counseling them. And the counseling is, is kind of extensive, but you know some, some things I want to highlight, you want to tell them not to take iron supplements, and then you want to tell them not to take vitamin C supplements because that will increase the iron absorption. Um, you want to you know, restrict the diet, dietary iron, um, and uh, you, know, you want to keep them updated upon like what we're tracking and, and, and all these things. So after you phlebotomize somebody with hereditary hemochromatosis, you know, they have, they may have multiple, you know, they might have multiple manifestations by the time you already got to them. So which of these manifestations actually reverses and which does not? What is the effect of phlebotomy? So let's start with the liver fibrosis. Does liver fibrosis improve or does not if you phlebotomize? Yes, no, maybe. No one? Okay. I'll start with the first one. First one is easy, right? Definitely improves. Otherwise, you know, does improve, especially when it's just mild to moderate. If it's more severe or cirrhotic, it's, you know, it's, or it's over, kind of. Um, how about cardiomyopathy? Does it improve? Oh, man. Yes, somebody says, oh, no, that's not. Okay. So there's limited studies about cardiomyopathy just because it's so rare. But some, you know, some of these studies say it may improve. How about diabetes? No. Yes. No. Yes. I heard somebody say yes. So diabetes yes. actually does not improve because they already have damage to the beta, the beta cells and it does not improve. Arthropathy, 
like these joint manifestations. Somebody said, oh, yes, 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 oh, yes, for the last one. So arthropathy does not improve. Hypogonadism does not improve. And then finally, skin pigmentation may, may improve sport. Okay, these are important to remember for the board. They will ask you about reversible, non-reversible. Second thing is... By the way, uh, Mohammed, yes. can you hear me? Yes. So just for the counseling part, just throw in, for the, since you mentioned the boards, of uh, shellfish, avoid shellfish, right? Yes, because that will cause the, the uh, Vibrio. Um, Vibrio, yeah. They could be increased mortality, right? Yeah. That's a board question. I yeah, just thought I'd throw it in. So the, the, the next thing is, is chelation therapy. So, you know, for patients who are intolerant, refractory phlebotomy, then you might do chelation therapy, but it's generally not recommended as the first line therapy, um, just because of hepatic. Um, just a few things I want to talk about. The PPI, some people talk about PPI for hemochromatosis because it, it inhibits iron you know, absorption. I'm sorry, I'm sorry, Mohammed. Somebody died. 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 Somebody 122. Thank you for calling. <laughs> Thank you. Okay. Um, so PPI is not generally recommended for everybody with hemochromatosis. And then finally, a liver transplant. You know, it's only considered an end stage liver disease, cirrhotics, or uh, hepatocellular carcinoma. Um, and then it's important to know that an iron overload, if patient is iron overloaded, it's not really a contraindication to get a transplant per se. Uh, and so you can recommend a liver transplant for people um, who, who end up with cirrhosis due to hemochromatosis. However, it does not resolve the issue, right? The issue is, is, is a genetic issue, not only in the liver, so they might end up with, with, um, with another uh, the onset of liver uh, injury. And the main important thing to know about this slide is that the prognosis of people with hemochromatosis really depends on the, the presence of cirrhosis on the time of diagnosis. So th those who are non-cirrhotics, you collate them, they actually have a normal mort mortality like the normal population. Um, moving to the next disease um, uh, is Wilson's disease, right? Um, so Wilson's disease uh, was initially described as a neurologic disease with cirrhosis of the liver. First described in like 1912 um, by Wilson uh, in his MD thesis. Um, and you know, the pathophysiology of Wilson's disease um, essentially uh, is accumulation of copper um, mainly in the, in the liver. And the reason this happens is that, you know, you have oral intake of copper and then intestinal absorption. And then, you know, uh, after intestinal absorption, the, you know, the liver, the hepatocyte uh, usually takes up the copper and then secretes it into the bile. Uh, and, you know, the way the, the way the copper is secreted into the bile depends on specific transporters. Um, the, other, the other thing that happens is that the copper is actually, you know, carried in the blood um, through stereoplasmin. So stereoplasmin is a carrier of copper. And so um, if you look at the hepatocyte, you know, copper gets into the hepatocyte and then, you know, the ATP7B protein or, or carrier takes up the copper, carries it, and puts it into the bile canaliculus, and then you secrete the copper. If there is a defect in ATP7B, then you're not able to, to, to take up the copper, and then a copper will accumulate in the hepatocyte and cause damage. So clinically, um, you know, uh, Copper overload or, or Wilson disease, that, that it's really a highly variable uh, clinical presentation. It can present with you know, neurologic symptoms, psychiatric symptoms, and it can present at pre pretty much at any age. Um, the, the subtypes of these clinical presentations are actually, you, can may, you may uh, present as an acute or chronic liver disease or a pro progressive neurologic disease mainly without liver disease um, or can present with an isolated hemo hemolytic anemia uh, or even a, a primary psychiatric illness. And so the important things we need to know about is the hepatic manifestations. These are more commonly uh, present in the young uh, Wilson disease uh, patients than the old ones. 
and they can in, they can present in an acute form of liver disease. So they can prevent with present with severe acute liver injury that may look like autoimmune hepatitis. You might have increased IgG, non-specific antibodies, ANA, ASMA, um, but Wilson disease really has a better prognosis than autoimmune hepatitis, and it can progress to acute liver failure. Uh, it's important to remember this because if somebody presents with acute Wilsonian uh, liver failure. Uh, what are the what are the classic things that we look for on the on the on the liver enzymes on the uh, LFTs that that might make us think this is Wilson, not something else? So the main mm -hmm. thing is actually this elk fast to T biliary ratio. So an elk fast to T biliary ratio of less than four, or you know, commonly we we talk about elk fast, low elk fast. Um, is really the one of the hallmarks. The other thing is actually a high AST to ALT ratio. Both of these things in the setting of acute liver failure are actually almost 100% diagnostic um, uh, for, for Wilson's disease. The neurologic manifestations are actually, they can present more in the older, second, third decades of life, and they can be either a movement disorder or a rigid dystonia. So movement disorders such as uh, tremors, poor coordination, loss of fine motor control, or a dystonia, rigid dystonia. And it, this looks like a Parkinsonism-like uh, syndrome where it's mask-like faces and rigidity and gait disturbances and maybe some dysarthria, dysphagia, and drooling. While the psych manifestations, um, these can present up to 20% of patients. They may even present with purely psychiatric manifestations. Um, they can be very variable, phobias, compulsive behaviors, acute psych illness, uh, mania, or aggressive behavior. This is what we commonly you know, look for, this is what we commonly like, and we think about these are the Kaiser Fleischer rings. Okay, Remember that they are dep deposits of copper in the cornea, uh, and they are um, mainly on the post superior and inferior uh, aspect rather than the lateral aspects. Um, so they're depositions in the decimates membrane, and unfortunately, they're absent in hepatic involvement. They're about 60% absent in hepatic involvement. However, they really present mainly present mainly in neurologic disease. When you have a neurologic disease, you might see the Kaiser Fleischer rings. They may also deposit in the lens in what we call the sunflower cataracts, um, and both of these actually disappear with chelation therapy. Um, so this is important. Uh, the other manifestations include what we call a Coombs negative hemia. And um, it can be secondary to copper release into the blood. And then finally, some renal disease and uh, Fanconi syndrome, actually, with amino acid urea and, and pulsaturia can, can present. To make the diagnosis, actually, there's one thing you, know, you can remember about this, is that if you have Kaiser Fleischer rings and you have low serial plasmin, that's it. You're done. This is Wilson's. Um, however, if, the, the, if, if it's more vague, um, then there's a diagnostic score that was evaluated. So the next step in evaluation of somebody who thinks he has Wilson is looking at a serial plasmin level and then looking at a 24-hour urinary copper level. Serum-free copper does not help you. So this, this can be low, can be high. It's really variable depending on the lab. And then serial plasmin also affects it. And how you actually measure serial plasmin can affect how much free copper you have. So don't look at this. And then finally, you know, actually looking at the hepatic copper with a biopsy and doing the Kaiser Fleischer rings assessment by a slit exam. So you need an ophthalmologist for this. Just one like quick uh, kind of uh, bit. When you look at serial plasmin levels, it's decreased by 50%, the typical finding. Um, however, there might be a false positive in people who have malabsorption. And we actually had a nice case like last year about this lady who was about 40 year old who had a Ruan Y gastric bypass, came in with acute psychiatric illness and had elevated liver enzymes and a low serial plasmin. And um, this case kind of, we were thinking about what actually this patient had. Um, and, you know, the, the differential would be copper deficiency versus copper overload because of the low, low serial plasma. Um, and up to, up to now, we still don't have a diagnosis. Um, I can follow up if somebody has questions about this one. I don't have time. Uh, um, so after you do all the, you know, after you're looking at the patient clinically, and you're do, you did your serial plasmin, you did your urine copper, um, then you, know, you can use the scoring system to actually see if, if you had established diagnosis of, of Wilson's or you know, 
uh, a possible diagnosis. So you can score them based on the on the neurologic findings, Kaiser Fleischer rings, the serum serial plasmin, and even based on the liver copper. Uh, and then see if they do have the diagnosis. And this is an algorithm, again, developed by, this is mainly from EASL, and they, they tell you what to do, what would be your next step based on these different scores. Uh, and so if you do end up getting a liver biopsy, looking at the hepatic copper, then um, what are you looking for? So you will get a liver biopsy either to exclude other causes or you don't have like a real good um, cause. Um, or to actually, you can actually evaluate the hepatic copper content. So you might see micro and macro, uh, macro uh, steatosis. Uh, you might see cholestasis um, or copper associated proteins, increased copper associated proteins here. And the main important thing for us to know is staining for the elemental, elemental copper in the hepatocytes. So you might have, you will have increased copper in the hepatocytes and this stain is, is um, the rhodamine stain, okay? So this is important for us. The rhodamine stain stains the copper. The other thing to remember, put a giant panda here, because when you do an MRI of the brain, you will have increased basal ganglia um, uh, hyperintensity. Um, and if you look at a specific section of the brain, the, the characteristic finding is called the face of the giant panda right here. Um, just something to keep in mind. Genetic testing for the ATP7B gene, you know, you have more than 640 mutations. It takes months to come back. It's really only reasonable if you're screening first-degree relatives. Otherwise, you don't want to send it for everybody. If you have an actual diagnosis of person, maybe you want to do genetic counseling and then look for a genetic test. So the general screening for people for hepatic for Wilson disease is anybody with chronic liver disease as part of the chronic liver disease workup, especially younger individuals. Um, and then currently, I know we're, we've been sending it for even the older than 40 years old. Usually it's less than 40, but even above 40 now, we're sending seroloplasmin to see if they have it. And then finally, again, the, the ATP7B gene mutation, you only send it to uh, look for genetic counseling and for first degree relatives. The important thing for us to know is the chelation therapy. So, uh, you know, how to treat those people. So if you do have an established um, Wilson disease, you want to do chelation therapy with either deep, deep penicillamine is really fell out of favor because of the, uh, a lot of side effects. So usually we, we use triantine or zinc. Um, and then finally, you can end up with a liver transplant, which is curative. Um, so when we look at triantine, and there's they they work in different ways. So the chelators are triantine and d-penicillamine, and then zinc is actually a absor absorptive blocker. It blocks the absorption uh, of copper from the intestine. And so, uh, how much do we treat these patients? So when you start them on triantine, uh, triantine or you start them on zinc. You want to look at different things. So when you initiate the treatment, they probably have high uh, urinary copper. Uh, and then, you know, your maintenance or what you're looking for is actually their 24-hour copper in the urine. And that's what you're following with every, with every, um, every time you see them as an outpatient. And so when you're giving them triantine, you're looking for high iron and uh, uh, copper in the urine. While if you're giving them zinc, you're looking for low copper in the urine because you're blocking absorption. You're essentially, you know, unloading them by blocking the absorption. So these are important things to keep in mind. You're looking at different things depending on what therapy you want to use. And you can use zinc therapy as, as, as sole therapy as um, alone for, for Wilson's disease. And then finally, you know, liver transplant is a curative, um, especially for people who have who present with acute liver failure, they might end up with um, a liver transplant and they, the new liver has ATP 7B and so has no problem. Unfortunately, the neurologic complications might not improve even after liver transplant. Few words about alpha-1 antitrypsin deficiency. Again, um, because uh, you know not much we have to offer these people with alpha-1 antitrypsin deficiency, it's important to note that people with alpha-1 antitrypsin deficiency, um, this is kind of a complicated slide, so this is the easier slide to, to think about. If you do have alpha-1 antitrypsin deficiency, two things will happen. You have hepatopulmonary disease. The pulmonary disease is caused because on 
insufficient alpha-1 antitrypsin will cause um, elast unabated elastase activity from the neutrophils, and you will end up with emphysema. While um, because alpha-1 antitrypsin deficiency is caused by a misfolded, mainly misfolded alpha-1 antitrypsin, this accumulates in the liver, and this is what causes the liver disease. And so, um, genetically speaking, um, it's an autosomal recessive disease, and it's caused by this PI or Serpina-1 gene mutation, which is what codes for the alpha-1 antitrypsin. You have multiple allele forms. So you have the M form, which is the normal, and then you have the misfolded form, which is the PI-Z form, uh, and then you have a deficient form, and then a null form. Um, the important things to remember is that the Z misfolded form is the one that will cause the liver disease. So if you have a double hit with the Z form, the PIZZ, then you will have the classic alpha-1 antitrypsin deficiency disease, hepatopulmonary. While if you have the null form, this does not cause liver disease because you, you're not making it, so you're not accumulating, but it's, it's, uh, it's damaging the, the, uh, the lung. Um, these mutations are common, the SZ mutations, they, they're actually common, uh, but you have to have the double hit to actually end up with the disease. Uh, and, you know, clinically, it's, again, a lung disease and a liver disease. And the lung disease is a pan emphysema, uh, which means it will affect the entire lungs. Um, and these people with the actual PIZZ mutation will develop cirrhosis and HCC later in life, even as, as um, in, the young, uh, in the young population. And so this is just an example of pan emphysema versus, you know, the emphysema you see as, as sentry lobular, which is generally smoking. Um, again, it can present, it present mainly with hepatic disease and a um, lung disease, depending on the age. And the pathognomonic feature, if you end up getting a liver biopsy um, uh, for these patients, is when you look at the liver biopsy, this is a specific stain, right? And this, I, I think everybody, we, sh we should know this. This is the PASS stain. So they are PASS positive, diastase resistant, uh, cytoplasmic globular inclusions. Um, so diastase resistant because, you know, the, the alpha one does not get, it stains by PASS, does not get. Uh, Come in. Yes. Question? Hi. Um, so. Me this. Actual diagnosis of uh, this. I think somebody is so, not muted. Missed. How was your vacation? Dr. Adam, your mic is on. Okay, I'm muted. Um, the actual diagnosis, uh, you know, can be tricky, but typically with anybody with acute liver injury, we typically send an alpha one antitrypsin to in the blood to see the levels. And so remember, in the misfolded form, the null form, it's gonna be it's gonna be low in the blood. However, it's an acute phase reactant, so you might have a false spot, a lot of false spot, uh, negatives essentially. Um, and so you know, generally, it's not recommended to screen everybody. Just if you're work, part of your workup for chronic liver disease, um, and then it's really targeted approach. You might end up getting a liver biopsy to end up, um, you know clinically diagnosing these people. And, you know, uh, we don't typically do the PCR analysis, but it's there to confirm the diagnosis. There's no available treatments. Um, and, you know, we really focus on excluding other forms of liver disease and trying to um, avoid further hepatic damage if somebody has alpha-1 antitrypsin deficiency. Um, however, there is like more, you know, more and more research done uh, about trying to stop the misfolding uh, by like some RNA technology, small you know, inhibitor RNA technology or some um, medications that's been like experimental, but nothing for now is like FDA approved or that we've been using for alpha and antitrypsin. It's such a rare disease that there's like really not much that, um, and I'm not sure if anybody's ever like seen it uh, from us or anybody who's hearing. So just take home points. When you look at liver biopsy, think of these three stains, right? Prussian blue, iron, rhodamine, copper, and then past positive diastase resistant alpha-1 antitrypsin um, deficiency. And then, you know, for iron, the, the C2A2Y homozygotes and a ferritin of more than 1,000, these people will get, need a biopsy. The phlebotomy goal is 50 to 100, ferritin of 50 to 100. And then Wilson's acute liver failure, low ALKFOS, ALKFOS to TBLE less than four. And then if you have a serial plasmin, a low serial plasmin, 
plus 24 hour uh, copper uh, urinary copper plus clinically this is how you diagnose wilson um, there is no like a criteria there's like depending on the score or the criteria from the easel and then the therapy of wilson when you put them on you know transient chelation therapy or put them on zinc you're tracking the urinary copper so every time they're going to do a 24 uh, hour urinary copper and then that's what you're tracking and remember for zinc it should be low for trantine, it should be high. And then finally, if you have lung and liver problems, think of the alpha-1 antitrypsin deficiency and think specifically of the PIZZ uh, mutation. Special thanks, Dr. V. And, you know, um, any if you guys have any questions. Mohammed, I just wanted to say that was a great talk on a difficult topic. Seems like you covered like lots of little pearls. Yeah, it's a bit honestly, it's a big topic, and I feel every one of these probably need, needs its own like lecture and stuff. Um, but there's other like metabolic diseases that we didn't even go into. Um, but I think uh, these are prominent for for our folks. That's, that's yeah, a great uh, presentation, Mohammed. I just want to ask you just uh, practical stuff. Uh, what can you do with the blood that you've phlebotomized uh, hemochromatosis patients with? Can you do anything with it? You can, I mean, I'm assuming you can donate it. I mean, that's what I, I'm assuming that's what they do. Um, no, that's correct. Yeah. So you just yeah. have them donate blood. So there's nothing wrong with it. So just uh, want to put it out there. Because uh, if you actually uh, do the phlebotomy, what do you, how do you do it? You just do it in the office or you send them to the local uh, blood bank? Oh. Obviously, it's the latter. So just you know, just bringing that up. Practical stuff sometimes have to be put into the lecture. So um, yeah. I, I know it's all boards rig, rigged up for the boards, but uh, should also know how to practice, right? Yeah. Thanks. A very good presentation. Very, very nice. Very important to know this stuff. Obviously, take it from me. <laughs> hey, Mohammed, I had just a question. Yes. Um, you mentioned cardiomyopathy may be reversible. I, yes, I, I have. I've had a few cases, I guess, years ago, where it was not. It was more in the advanced stage, or perhaps mm -hmm. if it's diagnosed very early, it's reversible. Did you see something to that? Because I, was, I, I, I didn't have that uh, understanding. Yeah. So I was looking when I was looking at this. Um, there is really not much like uh, big studies about like the cardiomyopathy, whether it's reversible or not. It's really kind of you know. There's some some reports. It's like more like case series. Some case series say, oh yeah, we reversed it after we did phlebotomy, and the others so, say, no, there, there's no difference. So that's why, like, if you look at the ACG, whatever they, they talk about it specifically, and they say we're not sure if it's reversible or not. So I think they just need to look in it more. It's just so rare that um, they don't have a good answer. But but uh, thank you, uh, thank you. I think I think it's important to early intervention because you don't want to get to the point that you have a cardiomyopathy that's irreversible. I think that's a, that's a moving target now since we're getting more aware of it and we're intervening quicker. I don't see too many cases anymore, but you know, obviously correct me if I'm wrong, but I've had the same experience, uh, Dr. Vignesh, is that, uh, that the patient is such a horrible cardiomyopathy was uh, somehow was missed. And now it's not, you, it's, you can't reverse it, no matter how much phlebotomy you do. Um, it's gonna take a long time, or maybe it's just inherent cardiac disease uh, to, and bad luck. Uh, so anyway, just thought I'd say that. Yeah. The uh, radiology point, you, Pearl, you made was a wonderful point um, that I learned only from radiologists, um, you know, by the primary and secondary. Um, if you don't mind sharing your lecture with all those nice points, that would be great. Yes. So I'll be sharing my lecture. It has a few notes in the bottom as well. And yeah, thank you everybody for listening. Uh, by the way, no, Mahan, yeah. there's a question on the boards also. I don't know if you touched upon it. How do you tell between hemochromatosis and hemosiderosis on pathology? Did you go over that? I, I went over the, the, how do you tell secondary versus primary? Like, how do you tell it's a... Uh, it's due to a like iatrogenic or um, or primary. Yeah, you did. You go. You went yeah. over the slides. I mean, and yeah, they show that biopsy. Yeah. They'll show you a slide and they'll say, "What is this?" I mean, 
pretty much. So anyway, that's just a good point. Anyway, but thanks. Very good. Yep. Thank you, everybody. I'll be sharing my slides. Take care. Have a wonderful day. Thanks, everybody. Have a good day. Great job, Mohammed. Have a good day, guys.